From Romeo and Juliet, Act 5, Scene 3, by William Shakespeare. Oh, my love, my wife, death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath hath had no power yet upon thy beauty. Thou art not conquered. Beauty's ensign yet is crimson in thy lips and in thy cheeks and death's pale flag is not advanced there. Tybalt, liest thou there in thy bloody sheet? Oh, what more favour can I do to thee than with that hand that cut thy youth in twain to sunder his that was thine enemy? Forgive me, cousin. Ah, dear Juliet, why art thou yet so fair? Shall I believe that unsubstantial death is amorous, and that the lean, abhorred monster keeps thee here in dark to be his paramour? For fear of that, I still will stay with thee, and never from this palace of dim night depart again. Here, here will I remain, with worms that are thy chambermaids. Oh, here will I set up my everlasting rest, and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from this world-wearied flesh. Eyes, look your last. Arms take your last embrace, and lips owe you the doors of breath, seal with a righteous kiss a dateless bargain to engrossing death. Come, bitter conduct, come, unsavoury guide. Thou desperate pilot, now at once run on the dashing rocks thy seasick weary bark. Here's to my love. The sea is calm tonight, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air, only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return, up the high strand, begin and cease and then again begin, with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Ah. Love, let us be true to one another. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash by night. Hamlet's Soliloquy by William Shakespeare To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. To die, to sleep, no more. 
and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the law's delay, the insolence of office and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sickly door with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Ada and the Swan by W. B. Yeats A sudden blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs caressed by the dark webs, her nape caught in his bill, he holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified vague fingers push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs? And how can body, laid in that white rush, but feel the strange heart beating where it lies? A shudder in the loins engenders there the broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead. Being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak could let her drop? Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized on a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Had we but world enough and time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Thou, by the Indian Ganges' side shouldst rubies find, I by the tide of Humber would complain, I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. A hundred years should go to praise thine eyes, and on thy forehead gaze, two hundred to adore each breast, but thirty thousand to the rest, an age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart, for lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity, Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Then worms shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honour turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. 
The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife, thorough the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. Go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. From the Princess by Alfred Lord Tennyson Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white, nor wave the cypress in the palace walk, nor winks the gold fin in the porphyry font. The firefly wakens. Waken thou with me. Now droops the milk-white peacock like a ghost, and like a ghost she glimmers onto me. Now lies the earth all Danai to the stars, and all thy heart lies open unto me. Now slides the silent meteor on, and leaves a shining furrow as thy thoughts in me. Now folds the lily all her sweetness up, and slips into the bosom of the lake. So fold thyself, my dearest, thou, and slip into my bosom, and be lost in me. Lit 130 by William Shakespeare my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. 